as I sh shared, we're going to be doing a sermon series going through the book of Matthew. And so we're going to go through the entire gospel of Matthew. It's the first book in your New Testament. Uh, when you flip that page from the Old Testament to the New Testament, we go into Matthew. And this is Matthew's account of the, the good news that, that Jesus came. Uh, we, we looked at a few of those passages towards Christmas time because Matthew does give an account of the, the, the birth of Jesus, the visit of the, the Magi, uh, not as detailed as maybe Luke does, uh, but he's, Matthew's got a reason for why he's writing the way he's writing. So we're going to go through this in chunks. Um, actually, what I'm doing today with our study in the book of Matthew um, is kind of concluding that first section. Matthew 4, verse 1 through 11 is what we're going to look at. That kind of concludes chapter 1 through chapter 4, verse 11. That's one chunk, one section. Matthew is purposely setting something up there before he starts writing chapter 5 through the end of the, the book of Matthew. He is trying to make this compelling argument that this Jesus is the Messiah, the promised one. He even goes back to something as mundane as giving you Jesus' family tree. If you read Matthew chapter 1 before, it's just a bunch of names. It's basically Jesus' family tree. Uh, this is the genealogy, genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, son of David, the son of Abraham, and then you just get a bunch of names. If you have your Bible and you've opened it to Matthew 1, you'll see all those names. Why is he doing that? Well, Matthew is setting something up for the rest of his gospel about who this Jesus is. And he's trying to make this compelling argument that Jesus is the Messiah, and he is the promised one for what the Jews would have learned about their whole lives growing up. Matthew's writing the way he's writing because his audience, at the time he's writing this, is primarily Jewish. He's primarily writing to a Jewish audience. They know the ins and outs of the Old Testament. They've heard all the stories. In fact, they've had to memorize a lot of these stories. And so Matthew is saying, this is the promised one. In fact, I'm going to trace it all the way back to Abraham because that's what everybody wanted to do to see if you've descended from Abraham. And so he starts there with Abraham, and he goes on from there. And so we're going to kind of conclude this introduction, this prologue to the rest of the gospel with Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 through 11. So he set up that Jesus is the Messiah, and now he's going to go on to talk about who this Messiah is. And what he's going to show us is what life looks like if God himself would walk on planet Earth. Because we believe that he did in the person of Jesus Christ. And so what we're going to see is Jesus do a lot of teaching throughout Matthew. We're going to call that discourse, Matthew 5 through 7. We're going to talk about that next time is this giant bit of teaching. Jesus sits down on the mountain and just, he just starts teaching. And Matthew is going between Jesus' teaching and then stories about Jesus. Jesus' teaching and then stories about Jesus. And what he is showing us is what does life with this Messiah look like? What does life with Jesus, life in this kingdom he's setting up, what does all that look like? Because the first thing that Jesus says, I'm not going to read it for you in chapter 4. You're going to have to do that on your own. When Jesus begins to preach of, of chapter 4, verse 17, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. We heard John the Baptist say that in chapter 3. And now Jesus is saying, it is coming near. The kingdom that God is setting up has arrived. Jesus himself is bringing it. What does that kingdom look like? What is life in that kingdom, life with the Messiah, life with Jesus, look like? So that's what we're going to talk about. We get to read about it in Matthew's gospel. The disciples got to live it, and many others got to live it with Jesus. But what about us? What is life with Jesus as a 21st century Christian living in the United States of America, in the state of Pennsylvania, in the county of Schuylkill County, and in the town of Schuylkill Haven or wherever you drove in from, 
what does life with Jesus look like now? He's not walking around here with us like we're reading about. But we're still trying to do life with him. That our lives are somehow reflecting his life. And in fact, we're trying to do our lives in a way that honors him. In a way that pleases him. So, so what does that look like? Now to set all this up, Matthew, after Jesus' baptism, retells this story in Matthew chapter 1, or chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Okay, so if you were here for Matthew chapter 3, that was January 8th. The end of Matthew chapter 3, we get this amazing picture, this amazing event that just took place. Jesus goes to John the Baptist, and John baptizes Jesus. Jesus comes up out of the water, and this dove descends like the Holy Spirit is coming on Jesus. That's what Matthew's telling us. The Holy Spirit is there as Jesus comes out of the, the waters of baptism, and we hear a voice from heaven. God, who has not said a word in 400 plus years, speaks. And he says, this is my son, whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. This amazing event just takes place. Matthew is setting up the fact that this Jesus is God's son. God himself is speaking it. And the Holy Spirit is descending on him. And what happens next? The very next thing is that Jesus is led by the Spirit, that's important to remember, out into the wilderness, that's an important word, by Satan himself. This is God's plan. It's not like Jesus was going out there because he was tempted to, and we're going to talk about that word tempted. You might have heard it said the temptations of Jesus. We're going to talk about what that word means. I want to suggests that the better translation is testing, and we'll see why that's true. But this is God's thing. It's not like God's surprised by it. It's not like Satan's convinced him to come out here. Jesus is led by the Spirit to the wilderness. That word, if you were a Jew, you knew that word because your ancestors wandered in it for about 40 years. And they wandered in that wilderness because they didn't trust God. God had made these promises. God had made these plans. God had said, I'm going to bless you. This is all Old Testament. If you want to really understand what's going on here in Matthew 4, verse 1 through 11, you've got to read about the wilderness wanderings, and you've got to read Deuteronomy chapter 6 through 8, and you'll get a bigger, fuller picture of what's taking place here. But every Jew knows that wor word wilderness because that's where they were tested. What do you believe about who this God is? And so Matthew is already setting up here, Israel, where you failed, it's not like God's like, oh boy, they were terrible, so let's scrap that, and let's try the New Testament now, and we'll read about Jesus. What Jesus is presenting to us is where Israel failed, Jesus would prevail. And that starts with a scenario that the Jews were very familiar with. The wilderness wanderings and being tested in the wilderness. In fact, it was there in the wilderness that Moses himself put God to the test. And, and Moses was prevented from walking into the promised land. I mean, this was a big deal in their lives. And now Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness, as Matthew is going to point out here, where Israel failed, Jesus prevails. But that doesn't mean Jesus won't still walk through the test of what do you believe about God, about his ways, about what he said, about what he promised, about his faithfulness. And so Jesus is presented after 40 days of fasting in the desert, 40 days and 40 nights of fasting, he's presented with some tests by Satan. To turn him away from God. So he's just fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And he was hungry. I'm willing to bet none of you went without food that long. You go, out with, you go without food between now and lunchtime, and you are already hungry. You are already thinking about bacon right now because it smells like bacon. 
We created a word for being hungry and how we get when we haven't eaten in a while. Mark, are you hangry right now? Is that why you knew that word? Borderline. Hangry. When you get really hungry, you know, you can kind of get irritated. Your fuse is about that long and you just get super hungry. It's a real thing. Food deprivation is one of the ways you can really make life difficult for somebody. And now Jesus is doing this 40 days and 40 nights. And imagine that without food for that long and how you would feel. What would you feel like without food for that long? And the thing that Satan says is the temper came to him and he said, if you are the son of God, now Matthew's telling us he is. Remember, we just heard God's own voice. Well, we didn't actually literally hear it. Chapter three say, this is my son whom I love with him. I am well pleased. We just heard that. And now the tempter is saying, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Now, do you think Jesus could have done that? All that we know, I mean, obviously, we've already read Matthew's gospel. It's not like this is the first time we're reading it. We think, yeah, of course Jesus could do it. In fact, Jesus is going to do some amazing stuff. He's not just going to make stones become bread. He's going to feed thousands and thousands of people. Now, if you read the Old Testament, God did something to provide for Israel. When they were wandering about in the desert... They were getting super hungry. They were like, God, do you even care about us anymore? You know, you brought us out of Egypt, and now we're wandering about here. I mean, I realized it was because we didn't trust you, but now we're wandering out here, and, and we're hungry. And the next day, God rains down from heaven manna. Literally, the translation is, what is it? They didn't even know what it was, but it was food. God fed them. God rained from heaven this food for them. Jesus could have, in an instant, made those stones bread. Jesus, who was fully human, knows what, it li what it's like to be hungry. He's experienced what it would be like. Imagine yourself for 40 days without food, and you have the ability to turn something into food. So here's the question. Jesus, are you going to do that? Or, as we talked about when we talked about Jesus' baptism, are you going to submit to God. Are you going to trust God and say, I'm going to give you all authority on heaven and earth, but it's going to walk and it's going to look this way. Matthew's gospel is going to detail that. Are you willing to submit to my will? Satan is testing this right now. If you are the son of God, are you going to submit to God, even though you could do this? Remember Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane? And he's praying, and he's saying, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus was showing the submission to God's will. He's done it perfectly. Where Israel failed, Jesus prevails. And Jesus says, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus was not going to thwart God's plan. God's redemptive story looked a particular way. Jesus willingly left his throne in heaven. That's what the Christmas story is all about. The king of kings, lord of lords, born in a dirty, stinky stable, manger. And now he has the ability to access that power. He didn't stop being God just because he was on earth. In fact, the Bible teaches the exact opposite. Jesus was fully God, even as he was fully man. And Jesus says, man shall not live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. He's simply quoting the book of Deuteronomy, a chapter and verse in Deuteronomy. Each quotation of Jesus is from God's own word. It's from the book of Deuteronomy. All of it has connection to what God was striving, seeking to do through Israel. And where they failed, Jesus would prevail. But he would walk through these tests. And he kept doing that as we read Matthew's gospel. He would walk through those tests. Are you willing to submit to God's will, God's plan? We know that that means going to a cross. Was Jesus willing to submit to that? Satan was 
testing that. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, there it is again. Well, Matthew says he is. Now Satan's saying, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, now Satan's going to do a little bit of quoting himself from God's word. Psalm 91. This is Satan saying, it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. And they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. If you are the Son of God, surely God would protect you. Surely God would save you. Surely God would care for you. Are you willing to show that, to put God to the test? Is Jesus willing to trust the Father, knowing that his life is leading him towards the cross and that God indeed would protect him, care for him? Jesus would ultimately die. Is Jesus willing to submit to the will, the plan, the redemptive story? If you are the Son of God, shouldn't God do this for you? And Jesus says to him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Trust him. All Israel did throughout the wilderness wanderings was put God to the test. God, do you actually care about us? Because we're hungry. Okay, here's some manna. God, you must not really care for us because we don't have any meat. Okay, here's some quail. God, you probably don't care about us because we have nothing to drink. Here's some water. Their clothes didn't wear out. Imagine 40 years. It's not like, you know, they were just going and get to the store to get fabric and make their clothes. Over and over and over and over again, God is showing them he is trustworthy. He is faithful. Jesus believes that he is, and he quotes this from Deuteronomy. It says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. So again, Satan says, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their splendor. And of course, from a mountain in Israel, you can't see all the kingdoms of the world. Scholars believe this is probably some kind of vision that they're having, uh, this kind of revelation that, that Satan is, is doing at this moment because you can't literally see all the kingdoms of the world. And Satan says, I will give this to you if you bow down and worship me. Now, Scripture in the New Testament, if you read different places, refers to Satan as the prince of this world. That this is Satan's kingdom. That Satan does have some power in this kingdom that we're currently living in. The one here on earth. We can see it happening all around us. Some of you have said to me, Satan is active and busy in a lot of different places, in a lot of different people's lives. And Jesus could stop it in a moment. But does he? Is he willing to submit to God's plan. Where is his allegiance? To the Father and his plan? Or to Jesus' own deity and ability to defeat Satan here, right now, if he wanted to? Because we know he could. The next thing that Jesus says is, away from me, Satan, for it is written, and he's basically quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6, like verse 4, the Shema, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Jesus says, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And he tells Satan to leave. And what does Satan do? The devil left him, and the angels that Jesus didn't call upon during this time of testing attended to him. Jesus could have stopped it all right there. But that wasn't God's plan. God's plan was for the salvation of humanity, and that salvation of humanity took a sacrifice, the perfect, spotless lamb. And the question was, was Jesus willing to submit to that plan? So Jesus is not, and Satan do not have this face-to-face -face confrontation anymore in the book of Matthew. Matthew where Satan is doing this testing. But every time Jesus comes across Satan and his demons, Satan and his power, you know, people brought demonic uh, people that were possessed to Jesus. And every time Jesus speaks a word, 
they flee, just like Satan did here. Matthew is setting something up that's important for the rest of the gospel specifically, but I want to suggest to you that life with Jesus and understanding these tests that Jesus went through are important for us as well. Because life with Jesus will be a test. You're tested in lots of ways in lots of different times. And the reason why I want to suggest to you that that word tempt is, more, is better translated test is because other places in Matthew's gospel and other places in the New Testament, this Greek word, parazzo, is actually translated that way. And so when the Pharisees would come to Jesus and they, they would test him with some teaching to see if they could trap him. That's the Greek word that's being used. When we think of temptation, we think about doing something wrong. I'm tempted to sin. And so it's I either do the right thing or I sin and do the wrong thing. And temptations are there. They exist. It's real. It can be very powerful in our life. But that's different than testing. Because we read in verse 1, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. This was God's doing. God wasn't tempting Jesus to do something wrong, to sin. In fact, what we're actually seeing is we're discovering whether or not Jesus is fully submitted to God's will and God's plan. Has anybody ever been able to live out Deuteronomy 6, verse 4? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Now, I, I'm, I'm trying to do that. But I'll be the first to confess to you, I don't, I don't do it all the time. There's definitely things in my life that I put in front of God. Has anybody ever been able to do that? Whose heart is truly and fully sold out to God, that that person loves God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength? And how would you discover if that person does? And what we see in this testing of Jesus is that there was one. There was one person who could live that out perfectly. That person was Jesus. And the genuineness of his faith, the genuineness of his submission to the will of the Father was tested in that desert. Just as Israel was tested in that wilderness, and Jesus prevails. And so what we see happening is kind of like this, this second phase of this story. Where Israel failed, Jesus prevails. He must be that promised Messiah. Only the Son of God we've read about our whole lives in the Old Testament could do this thing. And here we see Jesus actually doing it. And so as Satan is striving to drive a wedge between Jesus and the Father, and of course, the Spirit is the one who led him out there to the wilderness the Spirit is the one who empowered Jesus' ministry. We read that all over the place in the New Testament. As Satan seeks to drive a wedge between the Trinity, between this perfect relationship, full and complete submission, we see Jesus prevailing. And oftentimes, that's what happens with a test. A test is seeking to drive a wedge between you and God when we think about tests in our life, think about things that we go through in our life. See, as Christians, not everything is a temptation. Not everything is like, I got to try and figure out whether I should sin or not sin. The answer is don't sin, okay? It's pretty easy. We know the answer to that question. It's not always easy to do, but there are things in our life that happen. That's not sin or good or bad. It's just, it's hard. It's difficult. It's stuff that we don't ask for that, Hey, it's life, and it just takes place. And sometimes God uses those things in our lives to test us. What does life with Jesus look like in the 21st century, living where we live, having the life that you have? I've talked to a lot of people in my life. I've had a lot of people sit in my office. I've had a lot of conversations outside of there. Lots of Christians who question, why is God doing this to me? Why did this bad thing happen? 
I can't tell or I can't figure out why God would allow this to happen. And there's lots of these questions about God, and really what we're questioning is his, his good character. If God says this, then why is this happening? And sometimes God uses those things in our life to test us. Is God priority in your life? As a, as a follower of Jesus, as someone who says, I want to do life with Jesus, then you and I are actively, in the front of our mind, we're like, I want to make God priority number one. I'm, I'm going to actually try and love God with all of my heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then the world creeps in, and in our culture... There's lots of stuff that can take precedent, precedent over God. And maybe God allows some of that stuff to come into our life to reveal what's really in our heart. Well, Ted, what do you actually believe about me? Do you truly love me with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? And then things happen in my life these material things become more important. Other stuff in life becomes more important than God. It's not that those things aren't good. It's not that those things aren't important. But if we're not careful, very quickly those things can replace God. And before you know it, what's being revealed about us in our heart is that our love for God really isn't that strong to begin with. And in fact, what we're discovering is that our love for other stuff is taking precedent. Then we have to ask ourselves, do we trust God or not? You've experienced difficult things in your life. I, I know you have. I have too. Do we trust God through those things? Are we willing to trust God even when things don't make sense in our life? Even when there's challenges in our life? And again, I'm, I'm not even talking about I've sinned, and there's consequences to my sin. I've done some things that I've really screwed up, and because of that, I'm going to have some tough issues i got to walk through, work through. I'm just talking about regular life stuff, that things that we don't ask for that just happen. Are we willing to trust God in the midst of all that? You know, I, we weren't planning on having Jess's mom go to the emergency room on our way down there. Uh, yesterday and have emergency surgery. And, and for us, that was just one thing on a lot of other things that was like, oh man, this is just one more thing that we've got to go through. There's a saying that we have in our culture, when it rains, it pours. Because it feels like that sometimes. When one thing happens, you know, it's just like this little drizzle. Oh, that's okay. And before you know it, it is just this downpour. Do we still trust God in the midst of that? Because maybe some of that stuff is happening in our lives. And God doesn't stop this bad thing and that bad thing and this difficult thing. Because we're experiencing some kind of test in our life. What's in your heart, Ted? How is that going to be revealed? Am I willing to submit to God, his ways, who he is, and trust him? Even when I can't see the outcome, even when life gets really hard, what do we believe about God? Life with Jesus feels like a test sometimes. Jesus himself experienced that and Scripture, as I'll say in a moment here, tells us this is going to happen in our lives. The last test of Jesus is, is a pretty straightforward one that Satan is, is, is giving here. Either worship me or worship God. Where's your allegiance going to be? Allegiance to God had some very difficult implications in Jesus' life. Well, we read about it. We're going to be walking our way through the Gospel of Matthew, and we're going to be actually ending on Easter Sunday. That's the last Matthew 28. We're going to celebrate Easter Sunday, but a lot has to happen before that. Your allegiance to this God is taking you to a cross. 
Even though you did nothing wrong and you're being accused and their lies. And what does Jesus do? He remains silent before his accusers. Allegiance. Where is your allegiance going to be? You and I will be tested in this life regarding that allegiance. Is it going to be to God or is it going to be to something or someone else? Life with Jesus will be that kind of test at times. And sometimes it can be really heavy. And sometimes it can feel like you're being crushed under this load. But do you believe what God has said? I will never leave you or forsake you. That in this life, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. That I'm going to give you my spirit to walk through this life with you. Like all these things we read about in the Bible. Do we believe it's true? Or not? Are we willing to stake our lives on it? That's what allegiance is. And sometimes God allows these things to come into our life to do exactly what Peter says in his letter to a bunch of Christians living in difficult times. And he says, in this, meaning in your salvation, in the fact that you have been born again, you've been saved through Jesus, through his life, death, and resurrection. In this, you greatly rejoice. Though now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. I think if we show of hands who has suffered grief in all kinds of trials in this life, I think we all could say, yeah, Peter, that's me. Even life with Jesus, I'm still going through this. We shouldn't expect life with Jesus just to be amazing and perfect all the time. I can identify with that, Peter. Life with Jesus, I've had to suffer some griefs in all kinds of trials. But Peter tells this group of Christians in this letter, these have, these have come, these trials have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, and that faith is worth more than any gold which perishes in the fire. Your faith, which goes through the fire, will not perish. The result is praise and glory and honor. Because when Jesus Christ is revealed, you will receive the, the keys, the heir to the throne. That's what it means to be children of God, sons and daughters of the king. We are heirs along with Christ. So while you have to suffer some of these trials, it's simply proving the genuineness of your faith, which fire, the trial, the fire, can't destroy. And so life with Jesus, yes, at times will be a test. And some of you have gone through some of those tests. Maybe some of you are in the midst of some of those tests right now. But as Jesus has prevailed, Scripture tells us, Peter tells us, Jesus has shown us we can prevail also. Because you're not doing it alone. The same Spirit that empowered the ministry of Jesus is the same Spirit that God has given us. So come what may, we can weather those storms. We can walk through those fires. And in fact, what God is doing is showing the genuineness of this faith. That even though I don't have all the answers, even though I don't know why this is happening, God is saying, trust me in the midst of it. I think that's a concept that we struggle with at times in American Christianity. We just think everything should be perfect because we love Jesus. And what we see in Jesus' own life is that it wasn't. But what it did was strengthen us, mold us, shape us, in fact, show us the genuineness of what we believe. And that's going to come into play as we go through Matthew, Matthew's gospel. Next week, we're going to do Matthew 5 through 7. That's called the Sermon on the Mount. I'm not reading that whole thing next week. I'm going to invite you and encourage you to read Matthew 5 through 7 before Sunday next week. 
because we're going to touch on a bunch of different stuff. And this whole testing of our faith thing is going to come into play. Because your faith is going to be tested when Jesus says stuff like, you know that enemy, that person that's wronged you? You need to pray for them. In fact, you need to try and bless them and show kindness to them. Well, that's going to be a big challenge, that testing of faith. We're going to have them all the time. Life with Jesus will be a test. And it's going to reveal what we actually believe about Jesus. Matthew 5 through 7 is just the beginning of that, when Jesus teaches us about this kingdom. Are we willing to trust him? Come what may, are we willing to give our allegiance to him, trust him, and actually do what we desire to do and love him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength? That's going to be the challenge. And so life with Jesus, as we walk through Matthew hopefully is going to help reveal to us what we actually believe about him. And I hope strengthen our faith and our resolve to follow him no matter what comes our way, no matter what test comes into our life, that we're willing to trust God for who he says he is. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the fact that in this life, we're not left alone. But God, even in the midst of the tests and the trials and the challenges that we are faced with, um, God, that we can still trust you. And and actually what you're doing in our heart and our life, Lord, is revealing to us the faith we profess and proclaim to have. So God, I pray that as we walk through this uh, sermon series, Life with Jesus, I pray that you help us to figure out where we are with you. God, we are going to be challenged. Next week, if we read Matthew 5 through 7, there's going to be some challenging things in there. That life in this kingdom that you've set up is going to be hard to do at times. Are we willing to do it? Are we willing to trust you? even in those hard things? Are we willing to have faith, come what may? God, I pray that as we even walk out of this room uh, today, we're going to be faced with challenges, maybe some tests. Maybe we feel like we're going through some of that even now. God, I pray that you would strengthen us. I pray that we would be reminded that you go with us and that through the power of your spirit, we can overcome just as Jesus himself did. So God, as we close here today, I pray that you would challenge us, challenge us to love you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength and face those tests with a real genuineness of faith. And we pray all this in Jesus' name, amen.